Hey everyone, this is Quantsworth following an interview series where we sit down with industry participants to gain insights on everything from career advice to controversial topics in quant trading. Today we have Ernie Chan, the founder and chief scientific officer of PredictNow.ai. You may know Ernie through his multiple multiple books that he has written. Um, coincidentally, by the way, this is not a sales thing. I'm not being paid to do this. <laughs> uh, I have. Two of, I think two or three of actually Ernie's books on my bookshelf back there. And he's written some really, really awesome books in this industry that I really, really appreciate. So thank you, Ernie, for your contributions. I actually know Ernie first through, um, initially through the Quantopian community, by the way. So, you know, you were really big in that community into educating the quant trading community back when it was still kind of nascent and still very secretive, but trying to like democratize that industry. So really appreciate kind of all you do for this industry here. So I just want to start with my first question, which is uh, if you can actually uh, introduce yourself, because I know I didn't do you any justice, uh, if you could introduce yourself and then describe your latest endeavors. Oh, th thank you. Uh, th first, thanks for inviting me, Christina. I'm so excited to be able to speak here. I started actually my career as a machine learning researcher, but now I am running two companies. Uh, one is QTS Capital Management. It's a hedge fund. Uh, it's a quantitative, um, uh, you might say, crisis alpha fund. And I started that about 11 or 12 years ago. And it's still running, it's still going. And, uh, but I, you know, it's very fortunate that we had uh, been able to hire a CEO a few years ago to take over the management. So I have more time to focus on AI research rather than on keeping our regulators happy. So the other company that I'm running right now, as you mentioned, is PredictNow.ai, which is really a fintech startup that I started around 2020. And its main focus is really to apply AI for optimization, a particular asset allocation optimization. Uh, so that's the two things I'm doing uh, lately. Amazing. Thanks for sharing that. I'm really curious, how did you initially get into quant trading? I, I think it's a lot of sick and sack. I definitely did not grew up thinking that I would be in finance, not to mention quant trading. <laughs> I grew up thinking that I would be a physicist. But um, after six years in the physics graduate school in upstate New York, uh, very snowy, snowy out of the place campus, I discover that uh, I'm very bad in physics. <laughs> after all, it took me a while, but compared to my peers, I was very bad. Not to say that it was a lack of foresight, but you know, when you compare with people who um, was one of the leaders in the Manhattan Project, for example, back in the 1940s, you can you know, perhaps excuse me for, for thinking that I'm really bad in physics. <laughs> so anyway, it's a credit to the great compassion and kindness of my late supervisor that I actually was able to get a PhD in theoretical physics. But I think there's no hope to get an academic appointment. So I was very lucky to be able to get a job in machine learning research at IBM at that time. And, idea. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it, it, and it's in language modeling. I mean, language modeling is a big thing now. You know, everybody talk about ChatGPT, Gemini, and X, AI. And, but, you know, it actually been around for decades. And I was in one of the leading group at that time in language modeling at IBM. But also coincidentally, the guys who started the language modeling group, they have two guys, one his name is Bob Mercer, and the other guy's name is Peter Brown. And they just left the group when I joined. And I asked my partners, I mean, IBM is one of the leading language modeling group in the world at that time. Why would these guys left the group? And they told me, well, they went to a hedge fund. I said, what, 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 what is hedge fund? I have no idea. What, what, what does that mean? <laughs> and they say, well, hedge fund is where people make a lot of money. <laughs> so, <laughs> they, and, you know, Bob and uh, Peter told me they made three times as much as they, they made in IBM on, on day one. I say, wow, that's a lot of money. And then there's another guy that also left who was, you know, working for my boss. And his name is David Magaman. And everybody talked about David Magaman, how great a programmer he is. And they say, well, David Magaman also left for the hedge fund. I said, wow, that's interesting. You know, Everybody's working for this strange entity called Hedge Fund. So I got, got started to get interested in what this strange thing called Hedge Fund is about. And then after a few years at IBM, I keep hearing more and more stories about Bob and Peter and David and all the. And then they suck up more and more top-notch researchers from our group. The Galapagos brothers, Ambo went over. They are geniuses. They're super string theorists, and they left IBM right after 
David went left. So I also started to yeah. explore that. And after three years, I decided I'm tired of upstate New York. I mean, IBM headquarters in Rochester County, which is not exactly Manhattan. And I grew up in Hong Kong. So I'm a kind of a guy who likes city life. So I say, well, okay, I need to find a job in Manhattan. And the only job you could find in Manhattan at that time as a, uh, I guess, a physicist is one of the big banks. So I joined Morgan Stanley's AI group uh, as one of the top, you know, at the first like five or six employees. And that's how I, you know, got into finance. It's a very circuitous route. <laughs> I love that. I actually have two quick anecdotes for people who don't know who David Magerman is. Um, he's one of the leaders at run. He was, he's no longer there. He's running a venture capital fund today, but he basically helped run Renaissance Technologies, one of the leaders there for many years. And if you guys have heard that book about Jim Simons called The Man Who Solved the Market, David Magerman was the main source behind that book, by the way. It's his book essentially <laughs> is um, yeah, what I would like to call it personally. But yeah, so he's a really, really great person. I guess also full disclaimer, since you did mention this. So he is one of Data Bento's earliest investors as well into our company. Uh, and then the other funny story I had is um, the funny thing is you mentioned about, you know, hedge funds and money and kind of what is a hedge fund, right? And similarly, when we're interviewing back when I was running my hedge fund, when we were interviewing job candidates and, and I, I try to tell them, Hey, just answer honestly, or, why do you want to work here? Why do you want to work for a hedge fund? And I remember some of the job candidates would be very honest and say, look, if you look at the top, I don't know, 40, 50 richest people in the world today, a majority of them actually made their initial wealth through the hedge fund space. And, and that's kind of where they came from. And back then as, as well, it's like a lot of people had no idea and they learned this fact and they're like, wow, like there's something really amazing and lucrative about, you know, a career in, in this space. So thank you for sharing. That's a very fascinating story. Um, I guess I would be curious along those lines, like, you know, as you've been running both a QTS capital management, as well as going into predictnow.ai, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned over these years? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think that, yeah, I, you know, running a hedge fund is actually very different from running a fintech startup. That's the first lesson I found. Um, and, uh, you know, what work in a hedge fund, it doesn't necessarily work in a startup. So running a hedge fund is actually quite a regulated industry. The first key thing is that you can't just tell people, oh, you know, we had a great return last year. You know, why don't you invest? That you would get a stern letter from the regulator saying, well, you know, be careful. This time, we'll let it pass. Next time you'll be out. <laughs> so, you know, when you have something is really strange because you can't market it. You have to be very subtle in finding investors. You have to go through intermediary and you have to go to industry conference and talk about yourself without telling people how well your fund is doing. And it's really strange that you might have a great product, but you can't really tell people why is it great. And it is all done through, you know, very, very sort of indirect references and you know maybe Wall Street Journal will talk about you but you can't tell people directly you know so you are hoping that other people will talk about you and but not yourself and another thing about running hedge fund is also however the good side is that it is very straightforward in terms of whether you're success I mean usually running a hedge fund there are two met metrics of success one is AUM of course and the other one is you know Performance, sharp ratio, for example, for quantitative hedge fund, typically sharp ratio. And um, it's very numerical. So there's no need to really exaggerate how great you are because people just need to take a look at the numbers and they know how good or bad you are. Whereas running a startup, as at least a early revenue startup, you can't boast about your revenue because it's like minimal. <laughs> and even if there's a revenue, your expense so outweigh the revenue that is embarrassing to look at, you know, are you profitable? Of course not. <laughs> That's usually the answer. So running a, a, um, a startup, I find, is at least in the early stage, a lot of uh, sort of projecting, a lot of saying how great you will be instead of how great you have been. It, it is a re really different culture in my experience. And also, I found that running a hedge fund, it's very possible to start as a sole founder. You know, you develop the strategy, you might hire a programmer to build an automated system, maybe hire a data scientist to get the data and so forth. It's quite all right to start as a sole founder. Whereas building a startup, it is a little bit harder. I found that I'm much more of a researcher than a sort of sales personality. And it, it, it's easy for me to talk about finance. It's easy for me to talk about algorithm, uh, technology, but it is very difficult for me to convince 
people that there is a business future. But for investors, they don't necessarily care about how great your algorithm is because most of them couldn't understand it anyway. So you need someone to be able to have the personality to always sell, sell, sell. And, and so it's a little bit harder if you are so founder. That's, that's my takeaway. Yeah, I 100% agree with you and have noticed the same things as well. I think some things translate well, then other things really do not. (laughs) Culturally, you're right. You know, running a hedge fund is very, very different from the startup environment. Everything from who you want to hire to how you hire them to how you pay them to, uh, you know, all the little details in between, like how you market your product or whether you're allowed to market. And it's interesting, you're right. Thinking about the first time I had ever heard of like hedge fund, the term and what it is was in college, you know, growing up in a place like Utah, I never, nobody knows what hedge fund is here. (laughs) Um, So, you know, terms like that, we didn't know because we don't see commercials for hedge funds on TV. It's illegal. (laughs) So I think you bring up some really interesting points there for people to think about as they go off and do their own ventures or consider joining other startups and and stuff like that. Maybe a final question would be just curious, like what's next for you? Anything that's been on your mind lately? Anything else you want to share with us? Mm Mm-hmm. For sure. So obviously on the hedge fund side, our CEO is working hard to onboard other strategies. So actually our fund has evolved to become a fund of funds. So it's not just our own proprietary strategy, but we are getting pretty good at onboarding in, you might call emerging traders, emerging portfolio managers. And, you know, we are actually able to onboard these people that are really unconventional. Just one example. One of the guys uh, that had been doing very well in our umbrella, he traded out of a town no one had heard of in Kenya. And, uh, you know, if he go knock on the door of Millennium Partners, you know, he probably wouldn't even get a return phone call. But, you know, we worked with him over years to ascertain that he really has offer. And lo and behold, he, he made so far seven figures profit uh, for our firm. And, and he was just like one person sitting in a room somewhere in the middle of Kenya. And, you know, we were, now, of course, there are other examples in the early days of our fund where our advisor didn't work out, the sub-advisor didn't work out. But we learned to uh, sort of do sufficient due diligence and sufficient testing. Now that most of the people that we worked with who were on board to our fund had worked out well out of sample, not just in their hard track record, but the key is that they started to generate profit for us going forward after we hired them. So that's, I think, one of the sort of breakthrough we achieved in our fund beyond purely just research. Because, of course, research we do every day. But what we realized is that as a small fund, we couldn't possibly develop all the strategies fast enough in order to build a high sharp ratio vehicle. So that's something that we have been quite good at in the last few years. And we're going to continue doing that, you know, trying to onboard more emerging traders and fund managers. So that's exciting. And for Pitik now, we are actually um, going to explore different directions. So in addition to serving the asset management industry, we are going to start looking to other verticals, such as oil and gas, to apply what we learn in applying optimization based on machine learning to finance, to other verticals. And people say, well, you don't know anything about oil and gas. How, do, how, how would you be able to do that? What we found is that, and it's actually received wisdom in financial AI, is that finance is actually maybe the hardest domain for AI because of low signal to noise ratio, because of arbitrage activities, because of regime changes. If something worked somewhat well in finance, probably it will work very well outside. And so based on that sort of assumption, we wanted to work outside finance going forward. That's um, our next step. Love that. i um, curious, how do you go about finding good talent that may not necessarily, like you mentioned on paper, a company like Millennium would overlook, but how do you go about finding this kind of talent? Because I think that's like the holy grail. Every company's trying to find really good talent that may be more difficult to find or might be overlooked. But how do you go about doing that and getting, you know, making sure the data is all in place and everything? That's very interesting because all these talent, and in fact, everybody that I work with since I became an independent trader are inbound. I have never go out and find any of them. These traders reach out to me as many other traders 
that reach out to me. And the reason they reach out to me is because the books that you just just mentioned. So they all, you know, even my investor came to me because of my books. So essentially, I used the books as a, a way to tell people about myself. But beyond the book, of course, you know, there are so many high school students, you cannot imagine. High school students would reach out to me and ask me to mentor them. And there are some really amazing high school students that I've met over time. You know, there was a high school student recently from Bronx High School of Science. He reached out to me and he talked about AI in finance. I said, so what do you, you have read? He said, oh, I already finished the Marco Slopex Prado's book. Um, what was what, the next one? <laughs> so, you know, there are all these young, eager teenagers out there. And recently, my firm onboarded a, um, an intern. He just finished college at Columbia in, in finance. And he asked me, do you remember me? I said, no. He said, well, you know, you mentored me when I was in high school. Now I'm graduate. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I have, you know, seldom refuse anyone reaching out to me for mentoring and for re referral for reference. So, you know, b because I also actually teach part-time and I have been teaching part-time for the last few decades, both at universities such as Northwestern University. I've been both adjunct faculty there for more than five, six years, but I, I stopped doing that because I, I get busy with the startup. But I've always taught, taught at university, taught independently, taught at um, Quantum Steel, which is a for-profit organization for emerging traders. So because of all these educational activities, people tend to come to me out of nowhere for advice, for mentorship, and then later on, perhaps for internship or supervisory roles and so forth. So that's, that's how I get this pipeline of talent. Amazing. I wish more CEOs were like you and so giving and helpful to the next generation in this industry. Thank you so much for your time today and looking forward to following your journey into the future. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> Bye.